Welcome to the Kingdom Community. Many in the body of Christ long for authentic community and a spiritual family to belong to. We exist to connect, equip, and send you into the world to fulfill your destiny and advance the kingdom of God on the earth. To learn more about us, please visit kingdomcommunity.global. We look forward to hearing from you. Hey there, everybody. Glenn Blakeney here, and welcome to the Kingdom Community. My guest today is Dr. Mark Sharona. He's a pastor, an author, a life coach, and he's also a biblical counselor. He went through a season in his own personal journey with the Lord of just dire depression, anxiety, and he plundered to a place of despair. In this interview, Dr. Sharona unpacks his journey in terms of how he got to that place of desperation and how the Lord took him out. You're going to want to get a copy of Dr. Mark Sharona's book, On the Edge of Hope, No Matter How Dark the Night, The Redeemed Soul Still Sings. Let's jump into the interview right now. Hey, Dr. Mark Sharona, welcome to Kingdom Community. So glad to have you with us today. Glenn, it's great to be with you. Great to see you. We always love to start off our broadcast just by asking a question um, of our guests that just help people to kind of connect with you. Um, something about yourself that most people don't know, something that's unique. Apart from the fact that I'm a dysfunctional Italian born and raised in New York and I love the Rat Pack. So uh, my, you know, I, I was uh, growing up, I was an only child. Uh, which I regretted. I fought my parents tooth and nail because I wanted brothers and sisters and they just had a mindset based on both coming from families that were very large that they didn't want a large family. So that that led to a lot of challenges for me growing up and all the expectations of my dad, who was a man of broken dreams, um, mm -hmm. were pressed on me. And so he and I had a very strained relationship for a good portion of the first half of my life. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in my mid to late thirties, he and I had to begin to sort all that out because mm -hmm. I could never live up to his expectations. Um, but I was, I was a pre-med major to make him happy because he wanted to be a doctor. Okay. And uh, two years into pre-med, he, was drafted and was in World War II in the Battle of the Bulge, came back, and my grandfather um, told him he could not return to the medical field. He had to take over the family business and put wow. his brothers to work. My grandfather came over as an immigrant um, and started a coal and ice business wow. early in the days of the 1920s. And so back before there were refrigerators, there were ice boxes and home heating fuel was coal furnaces. By the time my dad came uh, back from the war, heating and air conditioning were becoming quite the, um, the, the, the business. And he, my grandfather sent him back to city college and made him take over the business and convert it to home heating fuel and air conditioning. So he vowed if he ever had a son, his son would be a medical doctor. And that's where all the pain started for me. Wow. Because I lived up to, I, I endeavored to live up to his expectations. It was never enough. I wanted to be a musician. That was anathema for him uh, for many reasons, including he was the church organist at the church we grew up in and he was taken advantage of. So he wanted, and then I came to Jesus and wanted to move in ministry. And so we had quite the bumpy journey until I was in my mid thirties. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's that's a, a great testimony. Um, so important, you know, as we go through life to be able to come to that place where we have to to really identify those things and deal with them. So um, glad you were able to do that. Yeah. And thanks. Thanks for sharing that. That's that's incredible. So we're here to talk about your book on the edge of hope. Mm -hmm. You wrote that really from. Uh, an experience you went through three years of a dark season. Would you just tell us about that time in your life? Sure. So that began um, somewhere in, uh, the, in 2007, in the summer of 2007, things had been building up and um, I hit 
a storm of perfect proportions. I, you could call it a perfect storm. And um, it began with uh, anxiety and progressed to intense anxiety. Then um, it led to sleeplessness, chronic insomnia, and then to depression. And so that, that triad of anxiety, sleeplessness, and depression was a deadly triad. And um, combine that with how sleep deprivation affects your outlook, and then put on top of that the kind of spiritual warfare that goes along with that. And I, I've, I've often said, and I say it in the book, if I had seen the bus coming, I'd have gotten out of the way. Um, and uh, I wouldn't wish what I went through on my worst enemy. However, having come through it and looking at where the culture is now and the increasing rise of anxiety and trauma and depression, I, I feel as though um, God is able to use it to help empower saints that may be indeed facing negative, afflictive emotions on a persistent basis with physical uh, responses that lead to deep unrest. So I'm hopeful that God will use the book to bring healing to the body of Christ and to whoever will read it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, I'm sure it will and is already. One of the things that you talk about, of course, is just this whole idea of, you know, everything being fine. I mean, it, maybe it feels good, but it doesn't last. I mean, it's it, we go through we went through a season in the church where, you know, it was all about the positive confession, saying the right thing. And uh, if you said, hey, I'm, I'm struggling, uh, really, that wasn't faith. But let's talk about your take on that, your perspective on that in the sense of what happens when that, you know, that facade disappears. Yeah, you know, um, Back in those days, you know, I, by that time, by 2007, I was, um, I was blown and going. I was at the top of my, we could say the top of my game, however you want to call it. I was immersed in the media culture of Christian television. I was known globally and I was very much um, in that vein of motivation and um, felt um, pretty confident that God was committed to what I was committed to. The challenge, I think, is that um, some of that leads to really unhealthy ways of dealing with reality and ignores the reality of affliction and suffering and the cross-shaped life that is replete in scripture and certainly in the teaching of the apostles and Jesus himself, who talks to us about the cross shaped life. He is the way he is the truth. He is the life. And that way is a cross shaped way. Hmm. And um, I think um, having had to go through that and be perfected through those sufferings burned a lot of falsehoods out of me. Wow. And, um, and mind you, I already had a degree in psychology, so I already knew um, the, the realities of what I was dealing with, but I couldn't diagnose myself. And so between um, a dear friend who was a pastor's pastor, who I dedicated the book to, who walked with me through that season... And sadly, the week the book came out, he died of a massive, of a heart attack. Mm. Um, so he never got to see the book in print or the dedication. Um, but m my dearest friend, my dearest friend, um, uh, he, he and then working with a, a, a really effective cognitive behavioral therapist, um, I had to work through all of that stuff. There was no easy, quick fix. Um faith and patience inherit the promises, but I had to really face the pain of negative, afflictive emotions and thoughts. Hmm. And some of them were deeply rooted based on my need to prove I was worthwhile 
to validate my, and that goes back to my relationship with my dad. Now I had been through the days of inner healing and all of that, but this was, this was a little bit different. This was really at the core of what was driving me, what was, and, and in the middle of that entire season, I was still being seen all over the world three or four times a week. I had to maintain pastoral care of my people. I had to function even though I wanted to die. Yeah. And so uh, it was it was quite the stressful season. Hmm. Yeah. Well, so Job uh, seems during your time of suffering, uh, you really came to appreciate, I guess, uh, and have a better understanding of Job's story. You just tell us about that. Yeah. And, and ironically, when Baker read the chapter on Job, they said, Mark, um, this is going to be too deep for the readership. I said, if I don't tell this portion of how I engage this text and read the text, hmm. uh, my, I don't have a story because hmm. it was, it was the way God dealt with me. You know, there's many ways in which we take a plain reading of the book of Job and uh, misread Job. Job is an epic poem. Mm -hmm. Solomon tells us in Proverbs in the first chapter, there are four ways to look at wisdom literature. And um, I go into some explanation of that in the book, but it's Job is a riddle and um, it invites us to look at human suffering when we feel like we didn't do anything wrong. Job is totally innocent in spite of his three friends who claim he's guilty. They never answer his questions. And God says to them, you misrepresented me. Job was innocent. You guys have no clue what you're talking about. You give, And that, I think, is, is the refined legalism, Glenn, that goes on a lot in hyper-faith sort of approaches that you must have done something wrong because if you really walk with God, you wouldn't be going through this. And all of that, all of that illusory, false way of reading the text I got delivered from in my dark season. And I began to read Job with a whole new pair of eyes and lenses. Yeah. So good, Dr. Mark. Thanks. So you, you make the statement that acceptance is not a dirty word. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So one of the most difficult things for me between um, the season I went through and what I was hearing from, a, my, again, my best friend who was also pastorally walking me through it and from the therapist was I had to accept what I was going through. Well, I mean, if you're geared towards I rebuke this, yeah. um, you, you don't want to accept it. And I, uh, the reason I didn't want to accept it is that at some level, I thought acceptance means you resign yourself to it. And I was laying down and dying. And that's the exact thing I, I didn't want to do. I wanted to survive. Mm -hmm. um, but until you can accept that you're going through that, you can't get to where you want to be. And so the acceptance piece involved a lot of inner work to look at not just the surface thoughts that were troubling me, but the mm -hmm. layers of belief underneath them. And I had to go about four layers deep, quite honestly. I had to get, uh, I had to get into the unconscious drives that I didn't realize I was believing that mm -hmm. I had to accept as something that had been deeply embedded in me for a long time. So it was an entire belief system that had unconscious drives. And until I accepted that they were there and, and faced them, in light of the truth, hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't going to get out of the pain. So, and that was the toughest part of the journey. Cause I was geared towards, I got to get through this. I got to get past this. I shouldn't be going through this. Why am I going through this? And all of that hindered my actual going through it and hmm. dealing with it and getting past it. Yeah. If that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you already referred to, the fact that faith and patience inherit the promises of God. And obviously you believe in healing and being delivered oh, from, from the pain. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm a living testimony now of that. It just, I'm an Italian from New York, so I'm dysfunctional. It took me a while to get through that. <laughs> okay. So let, let's talk about submitting to process to what God's doing in the process. How do we do that? You know, um, it, again, in the book, I, I talk about a conversation I had 
a few years before a dear friend passed away um, who was very well known in the body of Christ. Um, and I had interviewed him many times mm -hmm. on TBN. And um, we compared notes and he talked about not just the dark night of the soul, but a dark night of the spirit. And when I went back and looked at the early church fathers, John, St. John of the Cross speaks of a dark night of the soul, but then John Cassian also speaks of a dark night of the spirit. And um, one of the things that um, I think was really important was that the experience felt like God had forsaken me. He hadn't. But it was uh, the fathers, the early fathers talk about how God in his love. And again, this is with Job. What, what Nothing is going to separate us from the love of God. So when Jesus cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Mm -hmm. I think there's a sense in which we often... Um, um, sound as if God the Father forsook God the Son. Well, God can't forsake God. It's theologically wrong, and it's a very popular contemporary Protestant approach. The early church fathers would have said, this is blatantly false, and they do say it's blatantly false. God promises never to forsake us, but how can we believe him if, mm -hmm. if Jesus himself was forsaken? And how can it be good news to us as sons and daughters if in the son's father the love had any limits? Hmm. And so when Jesus enters into our abandonment, he experiences the kind of forsakenness that humans experience as what Chris Green calls a projection of the enemy's lies onto the screen of our minds that keeps us from seeing God in the circumstance. I had to learn in that season when the enemy was doing that, that God was present there too, endeavoring to show me how to walk by faith. Hmm. One thing we need to understand, when Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22, which begins with that, but ends with it is finished. And I would argue um, that while Mark's gospel and Matthew's gospel record the first verse, no faithful Jew would have prayed that psalm or any psalm by simply quoting one verse. That's an edited version. I think the entire psalm was something Jesus was praying through until mm. it is finished for the entire six hours he hung on the cross. Wow. So when he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Psalm 22 was one of the most beloved psalms of the exiles in Babylon. Right. And they sang it as exiles wanting to come home. And here Jesus, as the prototypical human, enters into our exile as becoming our sin offering um, so that he can enter our pain and give it a voice with the Father uh, mm -hmm. because our estrangement uh, forces us to have to cope with evil. But the Son in what he does reveals that the Father never fails us or forsakes us. Mm -hmm. And so he comes out on the other side triumphant, having spoiled principalities and powers so that we can learn in those seasons where it seems like God has forsaken us, that God's love has no limits. And that's what Job learns, essentially, that God's love has no limits and God's going to keep him no matter what. Yeah. Wow. If that, if that makes sense. Oh, totally. Very, very profound. So on that note, fear, um, you know, oh, Lord, if I do this, he's going to forsake me. He, you know, I mean, I met someone recently, I was ministering in another part of the world and this woman had been raised in a particular religious context. And she had this set of beliefs that basically her husband had died. And now her son who had experienced a stroke recently, uh, this was all because God was angry at her. Oh, father, how painful. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was. And so if we are to believe that, that, you know, if I if I just do this or, or I don't do the right things, then God's going to withdraw from me. He's, he's going to take his spirit from me or whatever. I mean, that obviously plays into fear. But how does how does 
fear kind of yeah. lend yeah. itself to these dark seasons? It's, it's a great question. And fear is present. Let, let, let me address that. Let me back into that in terms of a lot of contemporary thinking that comes from a twisting of reformed theology. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges that I think we have to face uh, in Protestant theology is how we've been influenced by the idea that God is a judge first and a lover second. That's not scriptural, but if you look at Calvin's institutes and Calvin's, comment, Calvin's commentary on 1 John, where it says God is love, he ignores that. Um, John Owen, in the death of death, in the death of Christ, one of the classic reformed treatises on who God is, argues that love is arbitrary in God, but that judgment is primary. I think that's unscriptural. I think that's a slant that ref some reformed Calvinists have taken that is very unhealthy and deals leads to the kind of teaching that tells people exactly what Job's friends told Job and what this precious woman uh, was going through, which only adds to their suffering and their pain. Mm -hmm. um, fear um, is a raw human emotion. And I, I know this will get some people upset, but it's easier to rebuke a demon than it is to deal with our emotions. Yes. And so we, we, miss, we fundamentally misread what Paul said. We, we take the King James, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power. And we turn that into, well, that's a demon. Well, that's first of all, King James English. It means nothing of what it says in the Greek. That passage has nothing to do with the experience of phobia. Um, that passage has to do with um, cowardice and intimidation in the right. presence of pushback. He's right. telling his son Timothy in the gospel, don't be intimidated by these folk that think you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. God hasn't given you a spirit of being intimidated. But, but phobia is real. Solomon says, don't be afraid of sudden fear. Well, that, today we would call that a panic attack. Hmm. I had them when I was in that dark season hmm. and my responses were habitual and automatic. And Job had those same kind of traumatic responses, which is why we fundamentally misunderstand. Again, we take a plain reading from the English Bible. The thing I greatly fear comes upon me and don't bother yeah. to go into the ancient Hebrew context of what he was actually saying. He wasn't the idea that he was creating these problems is a totally false way of interpreting that ancient text. Wow. Job was saying that the intense sufferings were so great that every time they intensified, they created an entire barrage of fears and traumas that further exacerbated his pain. This was not, I'm creating my pain. This was the stuff I'm going through is exacerbating and I can't even escape. I want to jump out of my skin and I can't go anywhere. I know what that's like. And for anyone that's listening, I just want them to know there really is hope and they're going to get through this. It's a season, not a life sentence. Wow. And God's going to heal them mm -hmm. of those aberrations. And, you know, Job's friends, sadly, are still around. The Pharisees are the same yesterday, today and forever. And yeah. we need to come to terms with the fact that perfect love drives out all fear. We have to learn how God perfects us in love. And God in his very being is communion. And that communion is love. The father loves the son. The son loves the father. And as the Cappadocian fathers, and as Augustine said, the spirit of God is the bond of love between them. So it's one big dance of love. God is Love is not arbitrary in the Godhead. Love is foundational. Judgment flows from love, not the other way around. Hmm. Wow. So good. Yeah. You, you write in the book that your suffering was demonic. And how, how do we recognize demonic activity that affects our mental, physical, and spiritual health? Yeah. So there was both emotional struggle, psychological struggle, and there was demonic oppression. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't one or the other. It was both. Sure. And, and, and one of the things that, that I think we need to realize is that the enemy doesn't play fair. 
so that we, we want to think that the devil plays fair and plays by the rules. You know, you go to a boxing match and there's a referee there and you, you, they play by the rules. And sometimes they get a dirty punch in and they get penalized. Well, the devil doesn't play fair. God is not the author of evil. God does not cause evil. God does not cause any evil. Evil is tied to the mystery of iniquity. And as much as we know about Satan and the demonic, there's things we don't know. And there's things we just go through that our only comfort is that Jesus went through that and is tempted in all points. But the, the, the difference between the satanic and the demonic, while it's all one big umbrella, is that Satan, the work of Satan himself and the satanic work of the powers of darkness is to separate us from the cross-shaped life. Mm -hmm. So if you remember in Matthew um, 16 and in Matthew 18, when, when, when G, I think it's Matthew 16, when Jesus says, who do people say the son of man is? Who do you say that I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus immediately begins to tell them about his crucifixion. And Peter, if you look carefully there in the Greek, Peter manhandles Jesus, rough handles and pulls him aside and says, you're not going to the cross. That's not going to happen to you. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Hmm. Satan's work in the life of a believer is to separate the believer from the cross-shaped life. You don't have to suffer. That's the satanic lie. Um, the demonic then comes in for the kill. Hmm. And so what you see at the cross is the demonic hordes coming to torment Jesus hmm. with all the afflictions of humanity. He tastes all of that for the whole. He's not just suffering as one person. He's suffering for as as the representative of all humanity, starting in the garden when he sweats drops of blood. He's tasting every human being that's ever lived and is going to live to bring salvation to the world. And the demonic is terrorizing. It's tyrannizing. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a dark season, the enemy doesn't play fair and the, and the demonic will come and harass and annoy and oppress and, and, and with smoke and mirrors, make you think you're forsaken mm -hmm. and actually convince you that you're never going to get out of it. It's a very, and, and, Learning how to refute that in naked faith isn't easy, but it's necessary. Again, I'm hoping this makes sense. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And uh, I'm sure it's ministering to a lot of people as they're listening and watching right now. I mean, there is something that happened in your journey. And you mentioned in the book, these two life-saving truths that you repeatedly return to one is slow down to the speed of life and the other slow down to the speed of revelation. Mm -hmm. yeah, tell us more about these concepts. This okay. is very intriguing. So nobody wants to experience anxiety. That's severe. All of us experience anxiety from time to time. Mm -hmm. And because we all experience anxiety, we want to quickly quote Jesus or Paul be anxious for nothing at a very surface level. Right. But when it comes to real intense anxiety, so let's let's use an example. Glenn, if you're in that studio and there's a doorway that's closed and there's a man-eating grizzly bear behind that door, <laughs> that's fear. But yes. you can keep the door closed. You can right. manage it because the door is closed until you get animal control to shoot them with a dart and send them back into the wild and <laughs> in, in Fort Worth somewhere or way out in the, in the Texas desert somewhere like by El Paso. Just find a place for the grizzly <laughs> or by, by a lake somewhere in Dallas, but <laughs> not here. That's fear. Right. But if in that studio, a gray phantom that's out to get you but doesn't have teeth but it's going to try to destroy your life and it can show up anywhere and everywhere. And you never know when it's going to show up. So you have this vague sense of unrest and restlessness that never goes away. That leaves you with what if, what if, what if that's anxiety. It's rooted in fear, but it's much more intense and it's a feedback loop that doesn't stop. And it's traumatizing because you never know where this gray ghost is going to show up and it's out to get me. That's anxiety. So that when you're dealing with that level of intense anxiety, simply quoting a Bible verse, be anxious for nothing, mm -hmm. is not that shallow. That's what we would call first order learning in right. coaching. Second order learning requires that I, I actually 
reflect on what's going on inside me and hold that before the presence of God. So, so when Jesus says, be anxious for nothing, we need to remember that this is the one who, when he gets to Gethsemane and he collapses to the ground under the weight of the trauma and feels the anxiety because the Greek bears this out and he sweats as it were drops of blood, his blood pressure goes up so high that the capillaries at the edges of his skin burst and he begins to redeem us and shed his blood in the garden from the severe angst, the anxiety that he's dealing with because it's part of the human existence. Anxiety is something that's a very human experience, part of the part of the brokenness of our human condition. But he's experiencing the total weight of that. He, he was he was he was literally immersed in it. So the one who says be anxious for nothing himself had to taste it at its most intense. Hmm. Paul, who says be anxious for nothing, but in all things with prayer and thanksgiving, with thank with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Well. Again, we oversimplify that because first and foremost, Paul is saying, you've got to pray through this, but you can't just pray through it. You've got to bring everything to speech that's deep rooted. That's what supplication is about. That Greek word implies you've got to get in touch with that deep pain that's got to be brought to speech because it's eating away at you and the enemy's taking advantage of it. Hmm. But this is the same, the person who says be anxious for nothing is the same one who says to the church at Corinth in the first epistle, when I was with you, I was with you in fear and much trembling. Yeah. He was battling anxiety. He was endeavoring. And then in the second epistle, he says, and the affliction was so great that I despaired even of life, that the sentence of death was passed in us. And he's actually saying, I wasn't the only one going through it. Members of my apostolic team were going through it. The, the excessive burden of what we were going through was so great that we, we had the sentence of death passed in us. We despaired of life. We wanted to die, but we had to trust in a God who raises us from the dead. So he's got severe anxiety. He's got, and, and then he tells us sleepless nights without number. So he's battling. That was very comforting to me in that season because I realized if, if Paul had to go through this, if Jesus had to go through this, why should I have the attitude? I shouldn't have to go through this. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a believer. I, 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 Jesus did all this. Well, he did, but suffering is part of the human condition. And as a pastor, how can I claim to function in a priestly and a prophetic way for my people if I, like Ezekiel, don't sit where they sit and feel what they feel? Right. When I used to, when we'd have altar services, I would give pat answers sometimes for folk with anxiety. I can't do that anymore. If yeah. they, I, I feel their pain now very deeply. Um, and it's not that I wasn't compassionate. I just, I was a foreigner to that level of sure. anxiety. But when it hit me, it changed my whole perspective on yeah. what people are suffering with. Yeah. Yeah. Abs yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, so talking about that, the pat answer, I mean, obviously everyone has their own struggles. What you're going through is, is their uh, unique challenge and, and journey. And, uh, I know you're obviously a biblical counselor and, and you've already mentioned uh, how you're involved in helping other people. But sometimes I don't think we even recognize that we're in a dark season. Um, we can numb out. Very, very true. We can numb out. Good. Yeah. And, and I know I've been there and, you know, been through trauma and, and stuff, you know, related to people, church and uh, just life, family, whatever. And, and that happens to us. But how do we begin to really kind of start addressing those things? I mean, we need to identify it. But so that's that's where we come down to the speed of life. So what I just shared with you was slowing down to the speed of revelation. I had to look at be anxious for nothing. Right. With all things by prayer and supplication. That takes time. Bringing mm -hmm. all that pain to speech. You say, well, I have to bring it. Well, you can if you, what you bury alive stays alive. So slowing down to the speed of revelation is that text may take three seconds to read, but it may take three years to live. Hmm. So slowing down to the speed of revelation is realizing we gloss over the Bible and quote it without understanding how the word becomes flesh. It's got to get from my mind all the way to my muscle. It's got to be visceral. It's got to be incarnated. And that takes the work of the spirit. That takes faith and patience. Slowing down to the speed of life 
we we want to we live in a a rapid paced accelerated change of of accelerated change culture and we certainly have to know how to keep up with the changes but that requires at an emotional level yeah. we live in the present moment being present to the moment and everything in the moment by being present to god that requires slowing down be still and know that i am god and what the anxiety was doing was distracting me in a very effective way and the demonic was adding to it between my own what if thinking and the negative painful thoughts that i couldn't accept because i thought if i accepted them they're going to have power but when i accepted them they lost their power i i had to slow down to the point of i was willing to be with the anxiety without letting it affect my values and the reason i was choosing to move forward in the kingdom of god wow. and that can only happen one moment at a time and i had to learn and look, if I think about it now, every day was pure hell for three and a half years. Wow. The only way I made it through was reminding myself of what Jesus said, let the day's troubles be sufficient. Because wow. anxiety is always anticipatory. Well, what's going to happen tomorrow? And those thoughts were there because the what ifs. What if I wake up? What if I don't go to sleep tonight? What if I don't go to sleep the next night? Well, that was real. I didn't sleep for three and a half years for the most part. But I had to learn to slow down to the speed of I can only live life one moment at a time, one day at a time, and deal with evil as it comes up one situation at a time. Mm -hmm. Every temptation I had to deal with is this is now. This is, this is a season. It's not a sentence. I had to, I had to remind myself that underneath are the everlasting arms. The Father is our dwelling place, and underneath are the Son and the Spirit. No matter how deep the abyss, undergirding us are the Son and the Spirit, so that God is, as Robert Jensen said, a place all by Himself. I had to discover that the secret place wasn't my prayer closet; it was Jesus. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, great advice. Very profound, uh, especially that last statement. You know, the secret place isn't in the prayer closet. I mean, obviously the Pharisees prayed, but they, they didn't have that. And, and it's certainly more, so much more than that. Um, so for those who are battling depression, anxiety, insomnia, like you did, despair, I mean, where can they turn to find authentic hope and, and really just get moving forward? Okay, well, well, we, we begin, no, and, and I would go back to that Deuteronomy 37, God is our dwelling place and underneath mm -hmm. the everlasting arms. So I have to begin with, I am loved. I have to allow the reality that God is love to become part of my awareness, even in the presence of my pain. Mm -hmm. And even when the question if God loves me, why am I suffering? Mm -hmm. That would not have been a question that the early saints would have wrestled with the way we do in the, in the modern Western culture. Suffering was considered a part of life. And so we have come to believe that we get a pass when in actual fact in Romans 8, and by the way, there were no eight, Romans 8.28 didn't exist until the 13th century. It was a letter written by Paul from to the Roman church, and the verses and chapters weren't added until a monk sitting on a, a horse in the 13th century put them in there. And so we, we, we Len Sweet says we, we suffer from the disease of versitis because we take a text out of context and try to make proof that that's what it says. But right. all things work together for good needs to be seen in light of creation is groaning. The spirit is groaning and we ourselves groan because of the sufferings we're going through. But right. all of those things are working together for our good. So Romans 8.28 is in light of all the sufferings we go through. What can separate us from the love of God? Death, life, principalities, powers, all the things we just talked about. In all of that, love is not arbitrary. This is so important because, again, Glenn, we, we both know that in the contemporary world right now, there's a lot of young voices that are preaching uh, a, a form of reformed theology 
that is that is a God who's angry and beat up his son so that we wouldn't have to get beat up, which means there's a there's this sense in which God hates us and where he's 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 delivering us from hellfire because he hates us and we and he abused his son in order to do that. that's a fundamental failure to understand the triune God of love and that God the Father never separate God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit mutually indwell one another. So the suffering of the Son of God is equally the suffering of the Father and the suffering of the Spirit because God loves us. He takes that on himself to show us, I'm not going to leave you and abandon you in this. And for those that are suffering right now, there is hope. There is help. You are loved. You need to learn how to be with the anxiety without letting it define who you are huh. and learning to accept. And I go into detail in that in the book. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of condensing that now and collapsing it, but I go into great detail in the book as to how to work through that. But we have to learn how to be with those negative, afflictive emotions and thoughts without allowing them or the powers of darkness to tell us this is who we are. I'm having those thoughts. Mm -hmm. I'm having those feelings. I am not those thoughts. I am not those feelings. They will pass. And depending, you know, with the late Lamartin Lloyd-Jones, when he did his sermon on Ephesians, when he gets to Ephesians 6, having done all stand in the evil day, Martin Lloyd-Jones years ago said an evil day can last for weeks, months, or years. That term evil day is a metaphor. It's not a 24-hour period. Sure. Paul wasn't talking about 20 days. And I went through an evil day that lasted for three and a half years. Yeah, God did bring me through. Yeah. He gave me songs in the night as when a holy solemnity is kept, as it says in the King James and Isaiah. And Dr. Charles Price, no matter how dark the night, one of the great preachers of faith from Pentecost, yeah. died in 1947. No matter how dark the night, the redeemed soul still sings. And that's why the subtitle of the book is No Matter How Dark the Night, the redeemed soul still sings. We yeah. are going to make it through. God's not going to fail us or forsake us. He loves yeah. us. Yeah, so good. So, Dr. Mark, uh, just share with our listeners, our viewers, how they can connect with you and pick up a copy of your book, On the Edge of Hope. As you said, the subtitle is No Matter How Dark the Night, The Redeemed Soul Still Sings. And then we'll they, say goodbye. Yeah, they can go to Baker, Baker Book Publishing, and they've got all the distributors, or they can go to Amazon.com. They can get it either in paperback or there's a beautiful hardback addiction, edition, and they can get it in Kindle. They can get it in Book Nook. They can get it in audio. There's even an audio book on it. It's, okay. it's out in audio book. So um, they can find it on all the major outlets. And then they can also go to our website at MarkSharona.com. Yeah, so good. So for those who are listening to the audio podcast, MarkSharona.com, M-A-R-K-C-H-I-R-O-N-N-A.com. So guys, so good. Yeah, powerful, powerful book. So needed, really um, extraordinary, honestly. It, it really is. And such, such a great and relevant uh, time for you to release this. So thank you so much, Dr. Mark, for being our guest. Man, it's and, an honor. It's great to see you. <laughs> you too. It's been quite a while. Yeah, man, man. It was before honored. my dark season. That's, That's how true. long it's been. You were down here in Florida, and um, that was just before I hit. I hit that. That bus hit me. Mm -hmm. So wow. Yeah. Well, I I can see obviously how the Lord has uh, set you on this trajectory, which is you know really so different as you mentioned of where you were. Yeah. before that dark season and uh it's it's great it's it's such a blessing to see that you've come out on the other side and you're doing well yeah i'm grateful for that amen lots of good stuff on your website by the way and i encourage you to connect with uh dr mark sharona at again mark sharona.com m-a-r-k-c-h-i-r-o-n-n a.com. Thanks for joining us today at the Kingdom Community. We trust that you are encouraged as a result of spending time with us. We exist to connect, equip, and send you out into the world to fulfill your destiny and advance the Kingdom of God. To learn more about the Kingdom Community, please visit our website, kingdomcommunity.global. Again, our website is kingdomcommunity.global. Together, we are better.